Hey everybody, I'm, uh, my name is Adam Kyle. I am a Principal Site Reliability Engineer uh, here at Athena Health and uh, welcome to this session of Untangling the Spaghetti, um, Moving Your Legacy Puppet Code to uh, Roles and Profiles. So a little bit about Athena Health, um, just a little about us. Um, we're a leading provider of network enabled services and mobile apps for medical groups and health systems. Uh, we partner with hospitals and ambulatory customers to drive clinical and financial results. Uh, we offer medical record, revenue cycle, patient engagement, care coordination, and population health services. Uh, we combine insights from our network of more than 160,000 providers and approximately 117 million patients with deep industry knowledge and perform administrative work at scale. Um, let's see, we have locations um, currently in Georgia, uh, Texas, we got a few areas in India, Maine, Vermont, Washington State, and Massachusetts. So we currently have data centers um, located in Texas and Massachusetts. Little in uh, overview of our infrastructure, we have about 5,000 plus nodes. Uh, there's a mix of webs, apps, databases, and other infrastructure related nodes. Um, they are geographically dispersed between uh, Massachusetts and Texas. About 90% of the infrastructure is uh, Oracle Enterprise Linux. And right now, um, we're about 75% physical and 25% virtual. So how did we get here? Um, we adopted Puppet in 2012. Um, the environment was, you know, it, it evolved fairly organically. Um, as time went on, uh, more people started to contribute to the code and the, the amount of kind of sprawl that was there increased. Everything was developed as one set of monolithic modules. Um, there was very little respect for boundaries with regards to the code, um, you know, the modules and the namespaces. Um, lots of code duplication. There were multiple classes that had maybe, you know, one line of difference in the code. Um, forge modules. They were mirrored, they were stored locally. Um, you know, many were modified locally. Uh, we used Perforce for our code repository. Um, you know, we had very minimal testing. Um, documentation was very minimal as well, uh, if there was any. And, you know, many of the original contributors had left. Um, so there was, there, was, there was a lot of missing context that people coming into this, you know, they, they could not, they, they didn't really have that. So what did this cause? Well, one thing is we had some pretty complex logic uh, contained within our node statements. Um, so this, this might look familiar to some people, or you know, I'm sure this, we, we weren't the only ones to do things like this. Um, this was a fairly common practice for node statements. Um, this section of the node statement was about you know, 300 or so lines. Um, other node statements were, you know, probably, you know, over 2,000 lines. So this section I've highlighted here, um, we see, you know, sort of a regex-based hostname selector um, that would set parameters, you know, based on the hostname. Um, this specific example had about 150 hostnames that it would, you know, act upon. Um, lot of node level variables being set here. Um, lots of ad hoc configuration, you know, um, example, there are certain app types that might get a special LVM and a certain folder, um, you know, certain includes that may or may not be duplicated in another node statement, or they may only have one line of code that, that that's different. Um, so a lot of these configurations, they ended up being implied um, as opposed to having these be explicitly defined as parameters. So what else did this cause? Inheritances. There was a lot of inheritances. Um, this is an example of another pattern, which we found to be pretty common. So let's take a look at what uh, seemed to make up, what we thought made up a dev server. Um, so we noticed that we got an inheritance here. So, you know, we drill in, let's take a look at that. We noticed we got another one. Okay, let's uh, 
you know, take a look at the next one. And yep, we got another inheritance. So we got to keep digging. You know, we all know where it's going. Finally, we get to the base. And, you know, that was my face, you know, with the first time I saw this. So what did these contain? You know, um, each one of these was probably about one to 300 lines of code. Um, it was a mix of file resources, package resources, cron resources, log rotate rules, you know, regex based hostname selectors to include things. Um, you know, there was no real rhyme or reason uh, as to how or why these were there. Um, yeah, so we did that again. So what else did this cause? Um, you know, what did, it, what did it all amount to? Um, it was spaghetti. You know, everything was so intertwined. Uh, it was extremely hard to follow. And frankly, it was just, it was messy. You know, and one of the questions that we, um, we would find ourselves asking as we went through this was, you know, why were these decisions made, you know, and, you know, at the time that they were made, they probably made sense, you know, but, it, you know, whether it was a gap in the knowledge of certain development patterns, or, you know, maybe it was somebody who was working completely siloed. So what did we do for this? So, you know, we started the process of moving the logic outside of the node statements, um, you know, to quote the engineer who, who started this, she said, you know, I, I just started rage converting some of these to profiles. So, we started slowly so as to minimize the impact. Um, we wanted a very small blast radius if something you know should go wrong. Uh, we started with one engineer, um, you know, and during that time, uh, we, we we there was a decision for us to uh, to move from Puppet Three to uh, Puppet Six. Um, you know, taking into account everything that we've covered, um, you know, this had its own set of challenges. Um, you know, you know, I can't, not going to go into the challenges involved. That would be a whole session unto itself. Um, that move was started in um, August 2019, and it was completed in July of 2020. It took about nine months to get the infrastructure provisioned and the code refactored to be compatible. Um, our ongoing move to roles and profiles helped with the transition. Um, it helped, you know, some of the refactoring of the code. Shortly after that was completed, um, you know, there was a there was an ongoing effort to move us from Oracle Linux six to CentOS eight. Um, so, shortly after that conversion was completed, uh, there was a decision to accelerate that effort. Um, the timeline that was presented it was pretty aggressive, um, and this is where things really picked up speed. Um, this started a ton of discussions. You know, our role in profiles conversion was ongoing. Um, but we still hadn't taken full advantage of the roles and profiles. Um, we felt that we had a strong scaffolding in place, which could allow us to make better use of the roles and profiles, you know, when moving to CentOS 8. Um, we also felt that this could give us a clean slate. Uh, we knew we were going to take on some tech debt, but we felt we could clean up more than we would take on. Um, you know, there was a lot of other debates, you know, you know, around, do we go greenfield? You know, do we stay in the brownfield? You know, do we, you know, kind of go green, you know, create a greenfield within the brownfield? Never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, in order for us to achieve this, you know, within these tight deadlines, you know, we knew that we needed to move this to some sort of GitOps type workflow. Um, all of the things which came along would be beneficial you know, to that process, you know, having multiple branches, pull requests, automated testing. So, you know, we made the decision to transition from Perforce to Bitbucket. Um, you know, we started to break down the types of servers that made up our application. And, you know, what we discovered was there was about five main types of servers that we had. You know, there were some subtypes that were within there as well. Um, you know, we decided to start with what we called the dev server, which was, you know, it, it would contain the basic portions of each type of server that we would build. So the groundwork would be in place, you know, when we had to flesh out the other types of servers. So what goes into a dev server? Well, we didn't really know. Um, the requirements for a dev server were never, they were never really documented. Um, you know, you couple that with the spaghetti that we saw earlier, we essentially had to reverse engineer everything. 
uh, the current dev servers were that we had, you know, once they were built, they persisted basically until the hardware would die. Um, they, they became pets. Um, so what did we do? Um, because we had to reverse engineer this, you know, we used classes.txt to determine what was actually being pulled in. Um, we could see that there was about 200 classes that made up a dev server. Um, each of these classes was reviewed pretty thoroughly to determine what did it do. You know, some of these classes we discovered they would just install one package. Um, some of them were just duplicated, you know, with just, they were duplicated classes with different data. Um, you know, was this needed? You know, we did our best to determine if something was still valid. Uh, we made some conscious decisions um, to do as what we call the screen test. You know, if we'll remove it and if someone needed it, you'd hear about it. Um, you know, was there a forge module that could be used? Uh, there's a lot of custom modules for things that were probably done better and more widely supported by the community. Um, you know, and if it was needed, how could it be simplified? You know, how heavy of a lift would it be? Um, was it a simple lift and shift? You know, was it a half a day's work? Was it a gigantic mess that would take a few days? We had a guideline that if it felt like if it would take more than a day, we would move it as is. Um, because, you know, we didn't want to put too much time into this and we would, you know, we would basically track these on what we called the, uh, a tech debt tracker, which just allowed us to take ownership of what we were deferring unto a later date. Um, so each type of server that we had, they had a corresponding role created. Uh, we created a base profile, which could be included in all the roles and anything that was deemed system related would kind of go in that base profile. So let's revisit what we saw earlier with this, this base class that we had. Um, you know, there was a lot of package resources being defined within there. Um, most of those were easy enough to determine what their purpose was. So we kind of felt that was low hanging fruit. Um, we knew that we could get that out of the way. You know, packages that um, were needed everywhere were put into a profile, which we could be used in other production type roles and profiles. Um, packages that we felt were um, only needed in the, in the development environment, you know, they were put into a more specific profile. And packages that were directly related to the application running were moved into their own role uh, profile, which could be reused down the road. Um, as we talked about previously, you know, we had a base profile, which would go everywhere. Um, dev servers also had their own profile. Um, as well as things that were related to the application. These were all included into, into our role for the elusive dev server. Um, you know, seeing that we were also now using Puppet 6, uh, we took advantage of the trusted facts, which are added you know, at the time the certificate is generated to determine which role this host would get. Um, the, this above methodology here, it was applied to many of the other resources within this base class. You know, cron jobs, they were broken out into a similar fashion. You know, log rotate rules. You know, we used a forge module, you know, and we broke the rules out in a similar fashion. If it was system related, it would go, you know, in some sort of base profile or a dev profile. You know, maybe your dev had shorter log retention than, than prod. You know, if it was a rule specific to a certain service, that was rolled into your service. Um, file resources were kind of done as, on a case by case basis, you know, and as a, after some research, you know, we realized that a lot of these were legacy and they, they weren't even needed anymore. Um, so we also had some included classes that were in here and this, this was handled a little bit differently. Um, you know, if they were determined to be needed, you know, they would be ported over um, as is, or if necessary, they were reworked to use class parameters and higher data. So, I'm gonna to try to walk through how we did one of these. Um, going back to the earlier example, you know, we can look at the complex node statement that we had. Um, you know, we see that TNS type here is being set in the node statement. We know this is related to Oracle. So looking through the node statement, I couldn't see anything which stood out, but I was pretty sure that this was gonna be contained somewhere in our base class. Um, so I checked the first include, there was nothing relevant in there. So I move up to the inherited class. 
And there I see the Oracle client. So when I drill down into there, I can see the TNS type is being consumed. So to me, you know, this was a little, um, this was a little convoluted and it wasn't, wasn't very explicit. So what we did was we moved the class to a profile and modified it to have um, TNS type as a class parameter. Um, we then set this parameter in Hira and then we include the profile into the role. And, you know, to me, this, this seems a little bit cleaner. Another thing we did, uh, which some of you may have noticed from an earlier example, is we made use of feature flags. Um, this allowed us to limit where and when certain profiles were being included programmatically. Um, we have a lot of snowflakes, you know, and some of this is necessary and it's on purpose, um, but we didn't really have the right constructs to manage this well. So this led to a lot of bad patterns, like maybe a regex host base name selector. Um, using feature flags like this, it allows us to have these snowflakes, but to keep our code manageable. So where are we at with all of this? Um, we're about three months in to our Oracle Linux 6 to CentOS 8 conversion. And we've successfully brought up a dev server, which you know, properly runs our application. Um, our developers can build virtual machines ad hoc using our uh, VMware vRealize infrastructure. These come up synced to the working branch. Um, our current dev server has about 100 classes. And that's about you know, half of what we started with. Much of the work for the dev server um, that was ported over to a standalone web server. Um, you know, our dev server was, as we discussed, mostly it contained all of the parts of all of our different types of servers. So we were able to easily take a lot of that work and port it over to a standalone web server. Currently, at this point, we're you know we're on our third type of server. Um, you know, what could we have done better here? You know, this isn't the end all be all. This is not the, the, the only way that, to, that this could be done. Um, we knew that we made some, some decisions along the way um, that, you know, may be good or maybe bad. So, you know, right now we have dual code bases. Um, we have changes happening in both. You know, our Perforce environment supports our production in infrastructure. Bitbucket right now is being used for the migration effort. Um, we will need to true these up at some point. And uh, you know the discussions as to how that's going to be done are pretty much ongoing. Um, this this took a lot of resources away from other projects. You know, at the start, you know, we had four full time engineers and four contract engineers. Um, you know, and as I worked mentioned earlier, you know, there was a lot of discussions um, around you know greenfield and brownfield, and and you know, did we make the right decision? And you know, as uh, you know, my manager says he's not sure if we made the right decision, but we made it consciously and, you know, we're better for that. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. Um, you know, before I go, I just want to say thanks to a couple of people. Um, this is the, the team, you know, David Danzilio, my uh, my manager, um, Sarah Coet, Sam Lewis, uh, Rob Nelson, all from Athena Health and uh, Dan Leach uh, from Kovaris. He leads our team of contractors that help us out. Um, so thank you very much and I uh, hope you all enjoyed it.